What about this, uh, uh, what you told me before about the, the ranging, uh, are you, do you still have any, some doubts about that or uh, is everything resolved now? Uh, we're getting good ranging data now, Gary. Сейчас мы получаем хорошие данные по измерению дальности. Super, Tom. Houston flight, Zug Moskva. Корабль Союз готов к стыковке. Sure, the flight director and the other people here in the control center are happy to know that. Uh, I'd like you to know that uh, Apollo is go for dock also. And if you'll excuse me just for a minute, I'll pass that word on now. Roger. Apollo Houston, I got two messages for you. Moscow is go for docking. Houston is go for docking. It's up to you guys. Have fun. All righty, sounds good. Apollo Vino, Mila, Alexei. Mid July 1975, an American Apollo spacecraft and a Soviet Soyuz spacecraft prepare to join in Earth orbit. 140 miles above the Atlantic near Portugal. During their two-day joint flight, astronauts and cosmonauts transferred between spacecraft. They conducted space experiments, and they tested a compatible rendezvous and docking system, evaluating its potential as the universal standard on future spacecraft for docking and rescue. The mission climaxed more than three years of planning and preparation a time during which differences in language, in technology, in political creed were set aside in favor of the common goal. This was the mission that opened the door to international manned spaceflight, the mission that set the course for joint flights of the future. This was the mission of Apollo Soyuz. <laughs> In the pre-dawn calm of July 15, the methodical countdown of Apollo moved with customary precision toward a mid-afternoon launch. Of lesser note was the fact that this would be the last flight of Apollo Saturn. And as the countdown narrowed, chances are that more than one member of the launch team reflected on other proud days of Apollo, like its nine flights to the moon six of which resulted in landing men there. It's three flights to Skylab, transporting crews to the orbiting space station. And now, in nine days, the entire Apollo program would pass into history. Apollo would make way for a two-way reusable vehicle, the space shuttle, scheduled for its orbital flight debut in 1979. But today, it is Apollo Soyuz, and as dawn approaches the Florida coast, a similar drama is nearing climax, half a world away. The scene, Baikonur Launch Complex in Kazakhstan, Central USSR. The Soyuz spacecraft, its crew approaching the end of pre-launch checks, is about to signal the start of this historic mission. At Mission Control Moscow, flight controllers monitor Soyuz as it gathers momentum en route to orbital altitude. Less than nine minutes after launch, Soyuz, powered by triple booster stages, is inserted into its assigned orbit. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. The countdown has proceeded smoothly uh, this morning, and the uh, flight crew here at the Kennedy Space Center were alerted about 10.30. 
there right now in the suit room at the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, uh, donning their spacesuits, and they're scheduled to leave the suit room about 1237 for the trip out to Pad B. The weatherman continues to be cooperative. A near-perfect day for the launch. Made to order for the thousands lining the roadsides and beaches to witness this Apollo-Saturn finale. seconds in the countdown. We'll hold down till thrust builds up. 11. Engine 10, ready light on. 9, 10, 9, 8, 8, 8 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 3 2, 2, Engine sequence start. Zero. 1, 0. Launch commit. We have a liftoff. All engines building up thrust. Moving out. Clear the tower. Uh, Roger, power clear. Roger, Tom, you got good thrust on all engines. You're right on the money. Apollo is placed in orbit. Go. And before the flight is three hours old, the docking module is smoothly extracted from the second stage booster, left trailing behind. During the next 40 hours, Apollo, through a series of maneuvers, will slowly close the orbital gap with Soyuz. The two crews will meet again, not as members of this or that nationality, but as friends who for three years shared their separate cultures and customs, and a part of themselves. In preparing for their mission, Soviet and American crews spent a good deal of time together. In formal mission training, in learning about the other man's culture, in getting to know the man himself. In the United States, I want to visit Hollywood. Alexei Leono, Soyuz commander. Because I want to be a movie star. Colonel in the Soviet Air Force. No, I don't want. <laughs> Tom Stafford want. In 1965, on the flight of Voskhod II, he became the first man to walk in space. Right now, we're, we're, we're optimistic we'll meet the launch schedule. The hardware's in good shape, as far as astronaut and cosmonaut train are in good shape. But when you put the whole thing together... The that's Apollo Commander, problem. Air Force General Thomas Stafford. Before this mission, he had flown three times in space. He was commander of Apollo 10, the mission that orbited the moon and qualified the lunar module for subsequent lunar landing. A civilian and a veteran of the U.S. space program, Donald K. Deke Slayton. One of the original seven astronauts, he was scheduled to pilot the fourth manned Mercury flight. A slight heart irregularity interrupted his flight career. He was returned to full flight status in 1972 and assigned to Apollo Soyuz as docking module pilot. Another civilian crew member, Valery Kubasov, age 40, the Soyuz flight engineer. On Soyuz 6, he successfully performed the first welding experiment in the zero gravity of space. Rounding out the American crew, Vance Brand, civilian, aeronautical engineer, former test pilot. He's been a backup crewman on previous flights, but this was his first trip into space. 
He is the command module pilot. As this was a time of mission preparation, it also brought together engineering and technical specialists from both sides. Heading up the teams were Dr. Glenn Lunny, the American project director, and his Soviet counterpart, Professor Konstantin Vushuyev. Under the direction of these two, an atmosphere of cordiality and mutual respect developed that pervaded the many months of meetings and negotiations. Joint groups were assigned to five general areas. Communications and transit, life support and crew transfer, mission planning, control and guidance, and mechanical design. This latter category included the building of the first universal docking system. The system's development, its ultimate testing in space, constituted a specific goal of the Soviet-American Space Agreement signed in Moscow in 1972 by the chief executives of both nations. Although each nation designed and built its own half of the docking system, the interface, that is the physical mating of the two, was a single design. Considering the language barrier, the differing technologies, two diverse political systems, the development program moved with relative ease. There were differences, to be sure, but none that was above negotiation and compromise. Perhaps Professor Bushuyev put those differences in the proper light. He said, in our joint work, there has been only one contradiction. Dr. Lunny drinks black coffee, and I drink mine with cream. OK, copy. This is Apollo Control. Apparently the uh, TPI maneuver was indeed successful. Tom Stafford reported from Apollo that he was station keeping with Soyuz. Both control centers, Moscow and Houston, have given a go for docking. Soyuz, Apollo, Cox, Apollo, Houston. Apollo, Houston. Can you see the Soyuz? Yeah, he's in behind the docking margin. Uh -huh. Here he comes. Uh, just above the docking module. Looks real pretty. Good job. Let's stay there. Look at that. I am approaching Soyuz. Oh, please don't forget about your engine. <laughs> Less than five meters distance. Three meters drop. Three meters. One meter. Uh, uh, yeah. Contact. Capture. Capture. We also have capture. Roger, Tom. We'll pass it on. Soyuz and Apollo are shaking hands now. Houston, Apollo. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, and go great to Professor Bushuyev. You got to my No, Professor Bushuyev. It was a soft docking. Around the world, millions watch and listen as the two spacecraft become one. Now they wait for the next dramatic event, the meeting of Soviet and American crews. All right, on a show. Hawk Revive, you look free. Okay, the camera. Ha-ha! Ah, it's just a Got it? Okay, stay open. Stay open. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Lexi. Mr. Uh, well, if you turn on the camera, hit the remote. Okay. Here. Uh, Glad to see you. Uh, Here. Passenger. Uh, Ocean Rod. Ocean Rod. Ocean Rod. It's a rush in. Soviet Soyuz. Sidionic Stratov. In the first crew transfer, astronaut Stafford and Slayton are hosted in Soyuz by cosmonauts Leonov and Kibasa. Vance Brand remains behind to monitor Apollo system. In the name of the Soviet people and from myself personally, I am To mark the occasion, you leaders of both the USSR the and the United event, States the relay their congratulations. The Soviet spacecraft. New possibilities are opening up for fruitful development of scientific cooperation between countries and the peoples in the interest of, of peace and progress of all humanity.
I wish you successful completion of the planned program and a safe return to Earth. Leonid Brezhnev. Gentlemen, let me call to express my very great admiration for your hard work, your total dedication in preparing for this first joint flight. It's taken us many years to open this door to useful cooperation in space between our two countries. And I'm confident that the day is not far off when space missions made possible by this first joint effort will be more or less commonplace. And may I say, in signing off, here's to a soft landing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Among ceremonies scheduled for this first day of joint flight are the exchanges of national flags by the spacecraft commanders. Later, they signed certificates of docking with the Paris-based Fédération Aéronautique Internationale, the organization that validates all aviation and space flight records. Finally, they sit down to dinner in space, Russian style. Right now, I've just finished some strawberries reconstituted. From Dick's eating some too. We're getting ready to eat some borscht, as you can see here. Following breakfast in their separate spacecraft, the crews begin the second day's slate of activities, which includes working on the joint experiment. An electric furnace is aboard for high temperature testing of metal alloys and crystal material samples. One of these samples is a joint experiment. Investigators believe that uniform mixtures of metals and perfect lattice structures can be consistently achieved in materials in the non-gravity of space. In the day's first transfer, Vance Brand visits Cagliari Kubasov in Soyuz, and Colonel Leonov is hosted by astronauts Stafford and Slayton in Apollo. Hello, American people. This, uh, the first Soviet American TV is Activities begin with a tour of both spacecrafts. Kubasov shows Soyuz to the American audience. Tom Stafford explains Apollo to Soviet viewers. It's been a most rewarding two days here in space, working with the Apollo Soyuz project. Soon after the third transfer, the spacemen field questions from the Soviet and American press. The Soviet Union and the rest of the world has seen the results of the determination, the cooperation, and the efforts by the governments of the two countries, by the managers, engineers, and all the workers involved. It's been a very rewarding experience. Roger, it's Moscow's uh, turn to ask uh, the questions that have been proposed by the press there. Thank you, Bo. Alexei Leonov. How do you think you're comfortable with the Apollo consider the Apollo spacecraft to be, and how do you like uh, the American food? Uh, Шесть часов пробыл на космическом корабле Аполло, это в космосе. Но, as all philosophers says, the best part of a good dinner is not what you eat, but with whom you eat. North of New England, as the workday ends, Tom Stafford presents Alexei Leonov's spruce tree seed, to be planted in Russian soil a gift from the American people to the people of the Soviet Union to provide a living memorial to the flight. The spacecraft commanders also join the two halves of an Apollo-Soyuz medal. One half launched with Soyuz and the other half with Apollo to symbolize the link up in orbit. When time comes to retire to their own craft, it's Dasvidanya, and goodbye.
The joint experiments would resume the following day, but only by voice. The next face-to-face -face meeting would be in Moscow in September. This is Apollo Control. At acquisition here, we should have confirmation of undocking and a uh, real-time television picture of uh, Soyuz from Apollo as it backs away. Preparation for the solar eclipse experiment. Solar eclipse occurs briefly and infrequently on Earth, giving scientists too short a time for adequate study. But with two manned spacecraft and proper maneuvering, a solar eclipse can be simulated. Thus, with Apollo blotting out the solar disk, the Soyuz crew train their cameras on the solar corona, recording pictures for later study. They dock again, providing yet another test of the compatible docking mechanism. Apollo Houston, uh, it was a beautiful docking. We had a good picture. We can see Italy coming up in the Mediterranean right now. Sure. Apollo Houston through Ats, and we're hearing your calls. Uh, Roger, we have docked. Everything was on time, though. After Did some three you? hours, the two spacecraft separate for the last time and Apollo maneuvers into position for the final joint experiment, ultraviolet absorption, the measurement of oxygen and nitrogen particles in the upper atmosphere. Apollo directs light beams of special wavelength to a reflector mounted on Soyuz. The beams bounce back to Apollo and are there analyzed by a spectrometer. It is the first such measurement by this method. The results have given investigators a clearer knowledge of outer atmospheric makeup, including the quantities of ozone in the upper atmosphere. The termination of the experiment signals the end of the joint phase of the mission, and the separation between spacecraft grows more distant with each successive orbit. Apollo will fly solo for four more days, but the crew of Soyuz makes ready for return to Earth. Good morning again. Jim Hartz and Alan Shepard from the Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, live this morning. The Soviet spacecraft is about to land in the Soviet Union. Soyuz recovery, a focal point of media coverage, is typical of worldwide interest in the mission. Not since the first landing on the moon six years earlier has the Houston News Center seen this much press activity. Beneath its single striped parachute, Soyuz settles to Earth in Soviet Central Asia. Retro rockets cushion the impact. Three memorable years have ended. Alexei Leonov and Valery Kubasov have secured yet another place in the history of spaceflight. Apollo continues in orbit, carrying out the remainder of the 27 experiments in space sciences, life sciences, and applications. Among the less notable passengers aboard are numbers of killifish. Sealed in seawater, they are in key stages of maturity. Scientists want to pursue an earlier investigation in which fish taken into orbit on Skylab had orientation difficulties in zero gravity, while those that were hatched in orbit adapted quite well. On return to Earth, the specimens will be compared to similar stages of Earth-raised fish. Through highly refined instruments, they look out in our galaxy and beyond. A new source of radiation is found, the extreme ultraviolet, which many scientists thought would remain forever invisible. Others felt it didn't exist at all. The discovery ranks high in importance and may open a new branch of astronomy for studying the universe. They attempt to locate the sources of soft X-rays, they probe the temperature and abundance of the interstellar medium. They test ways of long-term monitoring of aerosol particles in the atmosphere, which may have profound effects on our weather and environment. They look back on Earth on those features that will yield the greatest results, geological features, the oceans, the deserts, pollution patterns, 
weather formation, all the phenomena that comes under the general heading of Earth resources. As the mission comes down to the wire, the docking module is jettisoned, and it too becomes part of an experiment. With the two instrumented spacecraft close together in the same orbit, it is possible to measure their relative movements caused by variations in Earth's gravity. The technique provides a means of accurately mapping the Earth's mass structure on a global basis. Plano, go. Guido, go. Metro, go fly. DNC, go fly. Apollo Control, 99 hours, 29 minutes, go. phase go. elapsed time. Go. Flight Director go. Frank Edward. Littleton. Go. Pulsing his flight go. controllers. Ecom go. reports everything looks fine. Go for the burn. Okay, Crip, everything's up. Great ship up here. The only thing we're concerned about is that you've got all your splash down parties coordinated over. Well, I've uh, been working on that. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> In Pacific waters west of Hawaii, Apollo reaches the end of its journey and the end of an era. attitude thrusters that entered the command module, creating a hazard. Quick action by the crew in recognizing and correcting the problem avoided a potentially tragic incident. They were later hospitalized in Hawaii for observation and treatment. The symptom cleared in a few days, and the crew was released. The spirit and the letter of the 1972 joint agreement had been dramatically fulfilled. Hopefully it represents a prelude to the future, to a time when all mankind will share the work and the dividends of space. The space shuttle is a major step in that direction. The shuttle will transport into orbit a European development called Space Lab. With 10 countries of Europe sharing construction and cost, men and women of many nationalities will be able to apply their creative talents aboard Space Lab for the benefit of the world community. But for Space Lab, for Shuttle, for all the cooperative space efforts to come, the groundwork has been laid by Apollo Soyuz, the model for the future.